Are you live? Yes, we're live. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited this morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Happy, happy Friday. Uh, I am just full of so much energy this morning and super excited for today's In Her Financial Shoes podcast guest, the wonderful Katie Hill. Now, many of you will know Katie Hill from her long running children's program, Blue Peter from in back in the 1990s and also her flagship saturday morning show live and kicking like i literally that was my saturday that was the only <laughs> thing i did on a saturday morning and it feels so surreal now to be chatting to you katie um so Aww. thank you so so much for coming on the podcast this morning do you know what thank you so much for having me Catherine. i think i and thank you to everyone who's tuning in right now because i realized that it, these are strange times that we're all navigating and I did um, a yoga class the other day live and I normally do them recorded. You know, I, I like to do it at half seven in the morning and I just do it in my own time. And and I did a live one. And actually the difference in a shared experience in that moment, not in catching up on something was huge. So actually for everybody joining live, I just want to, you know, give you credit for being here and giving up your time to be here live. Because I do think there is something in the connection of all doing something at the same time that we've lost in this season of you know we're all down our own little rabbit holes of social media or whatever it is we're catching up on um so yeah well done for being here everybody nice to oh, see you yeah it, it's so true isn't it like we're, we're I, I feel like we're so desperate for connection right now like yeah. we've been in you know depending on when you're listening to the show but we're currently at the end of february 2020 so tw no not 2020 2021 oh, <laughs> you know but we are we definitely are seeking way more connection than ever before and and interestingly how i met katie was on clubhouse um just a few weeks ago i tapped into a live stream with one of my mentors rob moore and he was interviewing yourself katie and a few others about turning your passion into profit yeah. And um, I mean, Clubhouse is a whole like it's a whole new beast of social media. And, you know, I, I spent quite a lot of early time in the early days on Clubhouse and it, it just it took a lot of my time up. But I really enjoyed the connections um, that, I, that I gained through there. So very, very grateful for. And I think the connection is the thing that we're all missing. And so to make sure that you are trying to do things live, be that Zooming a mate, be that doing the cocktails that we all did with our mates at the start of the first ever <laughs> lockdown, and now we're all a bit meh. Um, you know, making sure that you're still getting those live connections because it's quite easy right now. You know, all of our worlds have become smaller and smaller week on week because you could easily be a hermit and just, you know, stay in your pajamas all day not a thing I advocate by the way um uh, and so to make sure that you are still connecting with people is is crucial and I think what lockdown has shown us is the the things and the people that are important to us in life and the people that you want to invest your time in and need to invest your time in to feel great yeah a hundred percent it's definitely given us an opportunity to reflect on what we're really grateful for I think mm. at the moment yeah definitely and I keep saying to my kids um it's funny because I coach these days and which we'll get on to but um we'll be sat at dinner and I'll be like you know how amazing will it be when life picks up again and actually all the things that we never realized were a deal um will suddenly become huge you know like how luxurious will it feel to go to a restaurant how gorgeous will it feel to sit on a beach all the things that we did in normal life in the inverted commas will just feel so epic like our senses are just going to be switched up to 100 aren't they it's like oh we're just not going to know what's hit us are we we're going to oh my goodness it's another human being <laughs> And we went for a massive walk yesterday afternoons because I'm um, big on walks with the kids every day, whatever the weather, we go out about three o'clock. And it was so spring-like yesterday. So we're, where are we? Late February. And, the you know, the snowdrops were out and it felt really different in the air. And you could hear the birds and it felt like a, a breathe out moment. Because I think for a lot of people, and I see it in my people coming to me for coaching and people who direct message me on social media, this season has people living life whilst holding their breath is how I describe it it's like oh, we're all waiting to do this huge exhale and actually now is the time to focus on 
how you want to show up for life going forward because there will be no magic wand you know whatever announcements come our way and however things start to gradually lift it's not going to be a magic wand you know the back to normal that we're all wanting what does that normal look like and actually will we ever get there probably not and so whilst those are the things we can't worry about what i'm massive on is making sure we're controlling the things we can so you know the things that you can't control let them go make sure you're controlling everything within your control to make sure you're showing up to life beyond whatever that looks like ready for life and ready for and equipped for whatever life throws our way in the future yeah i love that katie it's almost like we're, we're like you say we're waiting for something to happen and i know <laughs> one of the things that i like i really want to talk to you about this today because your energy and passion of helping people to live this limitless life is just so incredibly infectious you know every every time i hear you speak i mean even right back to the days when i used to watch you on blue peter you know that that energy is so incredibly infectious yeah, and I think I'm, I'm just passionate about about helping people to live all out because i just think it's it's why we're here it's like we get one shot at this thing and you know um so thank you for that because you know I, I i'm so passionate about what i do and this new journey that i'm on is such an amazing adventure to be at in this season of life i'm like you know i i just want to help equip people to live their all-out lives as well so let's talk about um your your work then katie so take us back a little bit to the the days on television and my apologies my my, my tech is a little bit slow this morning so if you're watching this live i keep freezing in these very <laughs> awkward but so, yeah, I've, I've done live today. I will just keep going. But you may well just keep going at some point. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, take us back, Katie, to um the, the first time when you experienced this feeling of being limitless. Like when did that begin for you? I mean, I let's um let's put it into context by saying first off, I don't particularly think that I live a limitless life. I think I live as all out a life as I possibly can. And my clients, I help them live their all out limitless, limitless life, whatever that looks like. But I don't think that I'm particularly limitless. This is the name of my company that I want to help push people to heights they never thought they could get to and help them to get there. Um, and actually, you know, someone said to me the other day, you know, so how do you have all the answers? Buddy, I don't have any of the answers. I have all of the questions, you have the answers for your own life. The only life I have the answers for is my own. And so I realized quite early on that I had, well, for example, when I started on Blue Peter, I had this dream that I wanted to present Blue Peter from about the age of six. And it was because I was a tomboy, as they called it then. I now realize it's just a badass girl. There's nothing boy about it. I was a tomboy. I was the one climbing trees, riding bikes. And, and this was in the 70s. Like this, there had been no Spice Girls. There'd been no girl power. <laughs> it was imagine a world without the spice girls oh my god we still got sewing kits for christmas like those were the days i grew up in and blue peter was the one place that i saw girls playing all out and doing the stuff that i really wanted to do and so that became my dream now i never equated being the spectacularly shy girl at school with landing my dream I never equated the two. And actually, at the age of five, when I'd say to people I wanted to present Blue Peter, they'd be like, amazing. You know, fast forward to when you're 15 and it's quite a different reaction from people. And somehow we have our dreams knocked out of us, for want of a better word, because understandably, adults can be nervous and they're kind of, OK, but what do you really want to do? You know, let's get. And actually to let a kid have that massive, expansive dream in their head for as long as possible because there is no rush you know the the kids growing up today I was speaking to a futurologist the other day she was saying the days of having a career where you are a teacher or a you know a bank manager or or a lawyer whatever it is that you are those days for our kids won't exist because the world is changing so quickly they will have a portfolio career they'll do something for a couple of years that will pivot into something else and they'll be constantly adjusting their sales as i describe it to go with what's happening around them so actually the pressure of what do you want to do isn't anything like it was when i was growing up um mm. and 
And I, you know, and I landed my dream in inverted commas at 24. And what was fascinating to me was I had thought once I land Blue Peter, I will be gregarious. Once I land Blue Peter, I will be so confident. I'll be unstoppable. And newsflash, I landed Blue Peter and I was the exact same person. And I had to take night nurse for the first three months of doing the show because I was so out of body terrified. And I... And I mean, that for me at 24 was such a eureka moment because it was like, oh my gosh, like being fulfilled isn't a destination. You're not going to land somewhere and your life is going to be, you're not going to get that job. You're not going to get that boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is that you think is going to be transformative in your life by getting somewhere. Being fulfilled is about living every single day true to your values, knowing where you're going, knowing what your potential is, knowing what your goals are, knowing what you want from life. That's where it is. It's not, you know, I think um, Rob Moore, who you and I are both fans of, you know, has a has a phrase, which is happiness is never somewhere else. And I feel the same about fulfillment. It's it's not somewhere else. It's it's now it's you and it's here. And do you know what I love about that as well is a lot of people, you know, that it, I mean, our podcast is very much about money and the beliefs we carry around money. And a lot of people yeah. think that, you know, if I just have a bit more money, then I'll be happier. And actually yeah. that happiness is, it has to come from that like intrinsic motivation, that internal motivation. And yes. Katie, you, you talk there about like getting that job at Blue Peter, you're still the same person, but that journey for you to get that job in Blue Peter, yeah. can you just share that story? Because it yeah, wasn't you know, it wasn't an easy journey for you no. and you, the I passion mean, yeah. you had to get there was incredible i mean i remember distinctly telling the careers officer at school when i was 15 that i wanted to present blue peter and their actual answer to me was yes but what do you really want to do because how can you advise somebody who wants to do something like that now possibly more because there are much many more media outlets you can study media at uni there is kind of more of a path then there really wasn't there were four channels and you literally had to get as much experience as you could behind the scenes because once you were launched on a channel it was it was national television to millions of people like there was no place to make mistakes and so the careers officer said what do you really want to do and I remember that firing me up and then I was having tea at my mate's house Joanne and I told her mum that I wanted to present Blue Peter and her mum said oh my gosh I always wanted to do that and I was like I just looked at her and obviously when I was 15 this woman looked ancient you know she probably wasn't at all but I looked at her and I just thought wow I never want to get to a point in life and think if only I always wanted to do that but I never did something about it and so I decided in that moment that I was going to go for it. Now, I had no guarantee it was going to happen. And I was kind of okay either way. It was more for me that I needed to know that I'd given it my all and it hadn't happened. And um, I actually had a mate at the time who said that she wanted to be on TV as well. And the difference in our paths, I, and this isn't me blowing my own trumpet, but this is just to show how the world works, right? There's a lot of talk at the moment about manifesting and, and about, you know, believe it and it will come your way and all and that's all great and I know the power of positive thought is super super powerful but mm -hmm. it doesn't take away your responsibility for doing the things you can do to get you there it doesn't mean lie on the sofa and wait for it to happen and my mate was rather trained you know on paper she was a way better presenter than me but she had the mentality that if it's right it'll happen I'll be discovered somebody's going to see me somewhere and pluck me out of security and throw me onto the telly I thought right what do I want to do I want to present Blue Peter how do I do that I need to step take the steps back and look at the goals that are going to get me to the big vision which is what I do with clients now and I wrote to the editor of Blue Peter in all my green innocence and I said hey <laughs> um <laughs> I love children. I want to present Blue Peter. And this was in 1991. And he wrote me this standard letter back saying, thank you so much. Lovely to hear from you. You know, get as much experience as you can. And so I did. And so I um, worked for free in local radio. I worked at weekends at this hospital television company with these very weird older men. <laughs> um, and and that kind of snowballed I taught myself to type so I could get a job at BBC Essex which was my local radio station I somehow convinced them to give me a slot on a weekend which we called Katie's Capers and it 
was terrible radio, but brilliant for a Blue Peter portfolio. Because <laughs> I basically said, let me jump out of a, an airplane with a recording device. It'll make great <laughs> fun. It was awful radio, but thanks BBC Essex listeners, because it got me there. Um, <laughs> And so I was working at BBC Essex. I taught myself to type. I got a job at BBC TV Centre in London as the assistant to the controller of BBC One, which was a pretty high-flying PA role. Um, and at weekends, I was moonlighting on Nickelodeon, which at the time was a, a tiny TV channel. And so I was just throwing everything at it. And then in 94, I went back to the editor of Blue Peter with the original letter. And I went, this is the letter you wrote me in 91. And here's what I've done about it. And I got an audition and, you know, and I got the job and and it was just, you know, people say to me, oh, my gosh, you were so lucky. And people used to say at the time. And, and of course, there's an element of right place, right time involved. But there's also a lot that you can do to shoehorn yourself into that right place, right time. And I think that's the element that a lot of people forget. I think they think it's just this airy fairy, you know the universe will make it happen type thing. And it's like, no, you cannot pass yeah. the buck. You've got, to, you've got to show up and do what you can do to, and take the steps to get to where you want to go. And you've got to take almost like that that fear and, and get past the fear. But the only way you can get past the fear is by taking action. Yes, um, absolutely. And I think, oh, taking nightness. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I think fear is a really fascinating word because I've got a t-shirt that says fearless on it, right? And people always say to me, oh my gosh, you're so fearless. No, I'm not. You just learn to fear less, right? Mm. The word fear, nobody is fearless. You have to step into fear to grow in any way. Like every time I did something brave on Blue Peter, I was out of body terrified, but guess what? I loved the adrenaline that came with it. I loved how I felt on the other side. And so it was worth me stepping into that brave place and doing the thing because then I'd look back and go, wow, look what I just did. That felt incredible. Yeah. And I think this whole season, um, vulnerability is another, another big word that you have to come to when you want to grow and get beyond it. And I think vulnerability is the thing we all move heaven and earth to avoid. But 2020 and 2021 has shaken us to the core it has shaken our world as we know it and so guess what you are vulnerable already right that feeling that you move heaven and earth to avoid is here and so how i would view it is right it's already like that so what can you build from here like how can you step into this vulnerable feeling and do that brave thing that you've always wanted to do i do think the pandemic's been horrendous obviously in so many ways that's a given and we would all wish it had never happened but it has and so if we can get anything from it and use it to power us up and and step into this vulnerable place so we can do that brave thing then I think you know it hasn't been a wasted a wasted year and and when you talk about and, and I love that analogy about like being fearless you just feel the yeah. fear slightly less than maybe you did the first time round yeah. and um that takes me back Katie to um when I but the, the biggest memory I have of you on Blue Peter was when you were put into this some kind of cage and, and like dunked into this water and then you had to like try and swim out and like and, yeah. I, and I've actually I heard you talk about this as one of like the worst things that you've ever done. Now you must have felt a huge amount of fear at yes. that time. How how did you get through that incredibly scary situation? Yeah, it's funny. I think I might actually share that video tomorrow on my Instagram account because you reminded me of it. And it was hands down the scariest thing that I've ever done. And the thing with Blue Peter, because we were on three times a week, the diary was so frantic that you'd literally sit down with the film team and they go, you know, Monday is London Zoo, Tuesday is blah, blah, blah. Wednesday is Yeovilton Dunker, right? So I had this thing in my file of facts at the time that said Yeovilton Dunker, not a clue what it meant. They said, bring your trainers. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we rock up to Yeovilton and it's basically where they train helicopter pilots in case they ever have to ditch into the sea, right? And people in the RAF have to do a refresher on it every year. Now, when I arrived, I discovered that if ever you kind of pull a sickie in the RAF, they check whether you've got the dunker coming up because everybody hates it and everybody does everything they can to get out of it because it is like hell on earth. It's basically this 20 foot cage 
which is a simulator of the insides of a helicopter. You sit inside it, you're strapped in a five point harness, which already set, sets me off, right? I, I get, I'm claustrophobic, I hate being trapped. So you've got mm. a five point harness on, they give you the warning, they lower the whole module into the bottom of a swimming pool, and then they like rotate it 180 degrees, so you're upside down. It's it's hideous and you do it about six times all different scenarios so the first time they'll say Katie you're man number one to get out so when it stops you have to find your way to the door kick it out get out or get everyone else out before you or whatever scenario it is then you do it in the dark and the weirdest thing is when you're on the surface you're like looking at your exit going oh yeah my exit's over there the minute you're underwater and you've lost all sense of where you are because they've rotated you upside down you don't know whether where's up, you don't know where's down. Like they showed us some videos of people who'd done it before, and there was this guy literally scrabbling, trying to bury through the floor to get oh out. He, yeah, it was horrendous. And they I think they had to kind of almost knock him out in the end because he because you're you're so kind of heightened to everything that you get this like superhuman strength of fear. And no. that was the worst thing I've ever done without oxygen and I hate holding my breath like awful but I did it and actually the learning for me from it was and what I do now with things when I'm really scared it's like what is the absolute worst that could happen like what the worst that could happen in that moment I knew I wasn't going to die because there were safety divers down there you know the very worst that actually would have happened would be that I'd panic and take a few lungfuls of water and then they'd hoik me out now that wouldn't have felt great but I would still be here and so now I always when I'm scared think of the very worst thing that could happen it's it's a bit like the first time I ever went skiing again I hate heights and the best thing that happened for me was the first time I fell over because I was like, OK, that actually wasn't that bad. And instead of falling and ending up at the bottom of the mountain in a heap, which is what I thought would happen, you fall and you slide, you know, 10 feet and then you get up again. And sometimes actually realising that the worst thing that can happen isn't actually that bad to take some of the fear away. I also really focus on why I'm doing that thing. So for me, when I was on Blue Peter, there was a huge element of wanting to inspire girls because I wanted girls to mm. have role models like I'd had growing up on the show. And so it was really important to me that I stepped up to do all the action-y stuff. And it wasn't at the time, oh, let's let the boys do it. Not a chance. <laughs> so that's why I was thrown out of planes and all of the stuff. And and the last lockdown, actually, the green, green lockdowns, I was in. I was in London and I was um, on the tube and I got off at Oxford Circus and I was just aware of this person running and this woman ran up to me and she's like, oh, you're Katie Hill, aren't you? Now, that's weird for me now because I'm on a different journey with my coaching. I, I feel slightly different than the Katie Hill of TV land. And, and so it always takes me aback when someone recognises me because I think I'm, anyway. A long story so um she said you're katie hill aren't you and i was like yes i am and she went i have to tell you you're the reason i became a brain surgeon oh, and I, wow. I, I could have burst into tears because she said you made me feel like anything was possible and now for me with my coaching like that is 100 percent my why it's helping people realize their potential and what their limitless life looks like and putting in the steps that will help them get there and helping them elevate life and I think when you've done a job that's that phenomenal at 24 and I finished Blue Peter when I was 30 it can be a bit of a hard act to follow because you're like well I've kind of lived 10 lifetimes before I'm 30 yeah. what do I do now and what's phenomenal for me on my new journey is that I feel like I literally am stepping into this whole new era that is going to be even more exciting than the one before. And I genuinely do believe that. And it's, you know, I turned 50 in April and at this point in life, it's like this amazing threshold that I feel like I'm just stepping over and loving. Oh, just like, as you, as you were talking there about that lady who came up to you to say that you were the inspiration yeah. of becoming a doctor. I mean... <laughs> that that must have just been such a real like validation almost of this is why I'm here I'm here to create impact and to help yes. other people how actually impact is my word for 2021 um because you know and and um 
Captain Sir Tom Moore um, passing, you know, that really affected me mm. because I looked at him and I was like, wow, I think he was 95. And I thought, wow, to, to reach 95 and to have never stopped pushing, that's incredible. Like he'd already lived the most epic life and he could quite easily have gone, I'm just going to have a cozy time now and everyone else can look after themselves. And he didn't. Like impact to him and, you know, having a legacy that he was leaving behind was obviously an important thing for him. And I think mm. one part of the word limitless, one definition in the dictionary of it is without end. And I think for all of us, you know, not to get heavy, but I think the impact that we're having on the world around us that will one day get left, you know, what is that impact? And, and you know, if you went tomorrow, would you feel like you'd had the impact that you wanted to have? And, you know, I was very aware that I had an impact in my early career. And then I wasn't having the impact now that I wanted to. And, and being on this new journey is just, you know, and I coach a lot of people who are feeling lost and they don't know you know their why and and all of the stuff and to help connect people and reconnect people to who they are um it's just it's the most exciting journey that I'm on and I do feel like a lot of the girls who grew up watching me on the show are now my coaching clients and that's that's amazing I love it and, and that's the power of a brand as well, isn't it? Building that personal yeah. brand for yourself. So when you when you think of the 95 year old version of Katie, yeah, how will you know, looking back at your life, Katie, that you've reached your full potential and your vision? I think just knowing that I have <clears throat> lived according to my values and feeling like I've just lived all out, you know, and I and I feel so centered in what those values are and who I am now and I think you know it's so important that we take the time and we kind of gift ourselves the time to ask ourselves the big questions that you never you never ask yourself I mean a great example of it is you know everybody on holiday for example sits on a beach once a year the first three days you're decompressing and then you start doing some amazing expansive thinking as you're looking at the horizon and you're like I'd love to do this I'd love to do that I'd love to whatever it is and then you get back and you're back on the hamster wheel and you never mm -hmm. take the time to get off and I think we're currently slightly off the hamster wheel with everything that's gone on and so before you get back on it make sure you're getting on the right wheel because then it doesn't feel like a hamster wheel you know I always want my clients to feel like their work life and their weekend life just kind of merges no one no one has that Friday or oh, everyone has that Friday feeling on my clock, but no one has that Sunday feeling because you're just feeling fulfilled and you're living a life that you love. And actually, it's about, um, you know, your the, the purpose into profit thing. It's it's profiting in so many ways. Yes, financial is incredible when you're literally living your authentic existence but actually in terms of how you profit in terms of family time in terms of how you feel about life you know that it's profit across the board and and actually one of the questions that came in from my audience I'm just bringing it up on my phone actually because I was I was thinking about this you know passion and, and profit and mm. I think part of the challenge is that people don't know how yeah. to merge what they love into making money from it because often we're you know we're in this golden handshake situation a lot of the time when we're in a nine to five job maybe we're getting a fixed salary and even yeah. the thought of creating something for ourselves is is a, is challenging because it's like well yeah. how am I going to make money from it yeah. um and one of the questions actually that my audience asked which I thought was a great question and this has come from Chris Buds and he's an expert in like financial well-being is he said, when we're attempting to turn our passion into profit, yeah. how do you ensure that you don't lose the passion? Because you focus on the passion, not the profit. And I think it all comes naturally when you are so grounded in who you are. I think a lot of the time we end up doing jobs, like for example, I did heart breakfast before I started training as a coach. I was doing heart breakfast and I was getting up at 3.30 in the morning and I was on air six to 10 and it was great and exhausting and all of the stuff. But I suddenly realized that I was living a life that had kind of presented itself, right? We all do that, like opportunities present themselves and you're like, oh, I'll do that now, particularly when you're in media, like you, the jobs come up and you're like, yeah, that will be fun, that will be fun. And actually it was a great life, but was it a life that was, 
massively authentic to who I was and I felt like there was definitely more for me and I didn't know what that looked like and I think it's very hard to leave a job or um even think about switching it up because we all feel quite comfy you know and mm -hmm. and there's that kind of homeostasis that we all we all feel you're just kind of flatlining through life like there's no lows but there's no massive highs you're just as I describe it, treading water, like you're not actually getting anywhere. And that largely comes from not being clear on who you are, what you want, and where you want to go. And so we do end up kind of trapped, for want of a better word, in these lives, you know, and you end up living a reactionary life, not a proactive life. So, you know, you and you also have all the different hats on, you know, and, and I always get back with clients as to who they are. It's like, who were you before you were their mum? Who were you before you were their dad? Who were you before you were their wife? Like taking away all the hats that we put on that have kind of come onto us throughout life and getting back to who we are at the core and what it is we really want is the key to then being able to build your big vision. If you're just kind of grappling for what is it I like? What do I like to do with my spare time? But, you know, you that doesn't work. You have to come right back in and do some real soul searching. And actually, I left Heart, which was a really brave move. You know, it, it was a great gig. Um, I did it for three years. And I my daughter was starting secondary school. And I thought, I want to be around more. And I want to look at, I've never taken some time for me. I'd been on this media roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And actually, to take the time and first of all I just thought I'm going to do a course in neuro-linguistic programming because I'm interested in how the brain works and then that led on to a full-blown coaching course and and I still didn't even know that I wanted to use it actually as a coach I just thought oh it'll make me an amazing mum I'll be a great friend all of the stuff and I mm. so got centered in who I was and this impact that I wanted to have which was the same impact I'd had at 24 just in a very different way um just you know I like reignited everything that was in there all along and it had just been laying dormant and you know designing the life that you want is so important because otherwise you just end up living the life that the world throws at you yeah and, and we and sometimes we end up living the life that other people or, or we we live the life that we think we should live based on yeah. other people's expectations or other people's judgments yeah I love that Michelle Obama said an amazing quote. She said, success isn't how success isn't about how your life looks to others. Success is about how your life feels to you. There are notions. And in coaching, the amount of times the word should comes up out of people's mouths, it's amazing. You know, the minute you go, should you? You know, there are no shoulds. So let's take that word away. It's liberating for people, but it's actually <clears throat> terrifying because there's something quite comforting in the walls we build and the, oh, no, I can't, I can't do that because da, da, da. it's like, and often actually I can't do that is I won't do that. It's not that you can't, it's that you won't because you built your walls so beautifully high and trapping <laughs> that you won't dare to step outside them because it is scary. You know, stepping into the bold place can be scary, but wow, it can be amazing. Yeah, and 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 I trained in NLP myself as well, Katie. And and what I loved about that was that, you know, it, it, actually that concept of limitless, those walls. You know, what would happen if those walls weren't there, or what would happen if those walls were maybe slightly lower that would just mm -hmm. enable us to kind of creep over the top. But what yeah. I love about NLP was the whole knowledge about how the brain works. That you know, we we have to go right back to what are we saying to ourselves? Because when we say things like I should or I can't do this, mm -hmm. then we're attaching what we think we can't do with our sense of self. And when our sense of self isn't good enough, then we don't feel like we'll be good enough to, to achieve maybe turning our passion into profit or doing something that we just know we want to pioneer or create change in the world. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the mind is such a, the mind is such a strong place that actually one of the things I get my clients to do is every morning they write out five affirmations about themselves as if they're true, right? As if they've already happened. Because your brain can't differentiate between what's imagined and what's reality. That's why Usain Bolt will visualize and step through a race many, many times before he finds himself on the starting block so that his brain and his body go, oh, we've been here before, this is fine, let's go, let's do this. It's exactly the same in life. So actually, five things that you want to be true for your life, if you write them down every single morning, subconsciously, you start acting on them 
as if they've happened. So whether that be, I want to be a Sunday Times bestselling author, or whether I am a Sunday Times bestselling author, you know, I am a phenomenal friend. I am in my best physical shape I've ever been. Whatever it is, you start acting on it without even realizing it. And the power of the mind is so incredible. I, I was researching this week about it and um, Harvard University did this study on some 95 year old men and they took them away to a retreat. And one group of men, they said, we want you to write your autobiography, just a generic autobiography, go for your life. They had a week to do it, right? The other group, they said, we want you to write about life in 1959 so they wore 1959 clothes they played 1950s music to the guys while they were in there they fed them 1950s food they were absolutely immersed in this 1950s era and at the end they did a second lot of tests on these guys and they found that nothing had changed with the people who'd written the generic biography but the people who'd centered themselves in 1959 their flexibility had increased. There, you know, so many physical things that you would associate with a 95 year old man had decreased because they had in their mind been that much younger, it had actually changed their bodies. And that is how powerful the mind is. It can impact your body. So imagine how your mind impacts your own mind and how things happen in life. It's so powerful. Oh, it's so powerful. And I, I think there was a, a TV documentary about that experiment, Katie, that you were talking about there. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can dig it out for you. It was, yeah, it was so, yeah. so like, and, and, and it is like the power, someone's just asked on, on the live here, what's NLP? It's Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's about rewiring the brain. Because actually, yeah. if you think about it, most of the beliefs that we hold about ourselves have either come from our personal experiences or they've just come from other people. They're, they're actually inherited beliefs that we've not even chosen for ourselves. Yeah. There's, a, there's a great book um, that I read last year called It Didn't Start With You by Mark Woolin. And what, what, what the author talks about in that book is how, you know, many of the traumas or limit the, the fears that we hold are actually not even our own fears. They're just fears that have been inherited from generational patterns. Yeah. I think it's fascinating yeah. to think about, you know, what fears are we actually carrying that are stopping us fulfilling our passion and purpose? Even, like even a really simple example of that, you know, I mentioned my not love of going underwater and I, I, I'm a diver, so I had to get past that one pretty quickly. But if you saw my mum swimming in my childhood and my dad, they were both like that. They were both the giraffe neck, you know. So obviously I thought there's something wrong with going underwater subconsciously and mm -hmm. never wanted to go underwater myself. So the things that we take on are so huge and the power of the mind, like a small example with NLP is, is anchors, right? So for me, if I'm outdoors in the summer and I smell freshly mown grass, I'm eight years old. I'm <laughs> better in my garden, like the power of the smell triggers something in your mind as a memory. So actually with NLP, it's making sure that you have anchors and triggers in place that are powering you up. And actually, if you have a negative thought pattern that you often fall down, I work with my clients to make sure that you're switching that and that you're putting tools and techniques in place that mean that you can pivot when that thought hits and go in a different direction rather than spiraling down. How important are habits then, Katie, in your in your work with clients or in your own personal work? How important are habits to you? And are there any habits that you religiously do every day? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, for me, through this whole pandemic experience, habits have been my absolute lifeline, because I think it's that feeling of life being out of control. If you're controlling something and for me, mornings are massive. So my morning routine has not changed in the pandemic, even though I've been homeschooling, I've had two children at home, I've been cooking all day long, it feels like, but my morning routine is non-negotiable. And the reason for that is in school time, if I wake up when the children wake up, I feel on the back foot and that feeling of, you know, you're on the back foot, chasing, chasing till you get them to school, then you're on the back foot with work. And actually, I, when I did heart breakfast, I realised the importance of early mornings and how it made me feel so energized for the day if I subconsciously or consciously realized that I was achieving a huge amount before the day technically started. So even in the pandemic, my alarm goes off at six, sometimes 6.30, but normally six. And I'll wake up, I drink a whole thing of water, 
that much water before I have my coffee. And then I will have a coffee and then I do a half hour of yoga and I do my affirmations and I set myself up for the day with how I want the day to be. So that when the children come down, I'm 100% in the zone with them and I'm really nice. glad to see them. I'm not on my phone and I'm not trying to do emails. Like I feel like I've got a head on the day and so I can be in the zone with them, preparing them for their day. And then when we're not in a pandemic, they're off to school at nine and my full day can start. But for me, in this whole uncertain time, being able to control the things in my sphere of control have been so important. Even tiny things like I get up and make my bed straight away. And believe me, there's a lot of cushions on my bed. <laughs> So it's quite the process but it means that subconsciously I'm starting the day on a win it's like okay I've done that you know likewise I have my workout gear laying next to the bed because I have to fall over it to be able to <laughs> put it on so I may as well just put it on and and before you know it you're just kind of doing the habits and doing all the things and there's so much you know particularly exercise and nutrition that we know is amazing for us and we know how we feel after a run or after doing yoga or going for a massive walk and yet for some reason we self-sabotage and fight it the whole time mm -hmm. and find any excuse and I always say you can either make excuses for 20 minutes or you can just freaking do it you know <laughs> it's like just do it just do it what about what about evening habits do you because I'm, I'm really curious to this like and I've, I've read pretty much every book on the planet. And I'm sure, Katie, you probably read books like Atomic Habits by James Clear. And like, there's so many, like the morning routine. There's yeah. so many books that have got some great tips about creating morning routines. But do yeah. you have any evening routines that you get into or is it just the morning? Yeah, I am more of a morning person. Evenings, I try to do some gratitude before I go to bed. So I literally have a notebook next to my bed and I write three things I'm grateful for from that day. Now, gratitude, is different than the morning affirmations. It can't be a generic, I'm grateful for my health, right? It needs to be laser focused on something that happened that day. So it's like, you know, I'm grateful that the green smoothie that I had made me feel amazing, or I'm so grateful for that walk I went on, the sky was incredible, it felt like spring was in the air. It's really taking the time to notice the small mm -hmm. things within your day. Um, and if I've got something big happening the next day, so say I was doing a talk, for example, a keynote talk, I, I'm always nervous for those. Everybody is like anyone who says they're not nervous before speaking in front of an audience is lying <laughs> because it's good to have some adrenaline. But I've taught myself to to instead of the kind of nerves, I, I turn it into excitement because physiologically. And you reframed. Reframed. Yeah. yeah. Mm. nerves and excitement are very very similar so I tell myself I'm just really excited for the impact I'm going to have and actually when I'm going to sleep I visualize doing the talk so getting the mic on walking out onto the stage doing the talk and how I feel afterwards and always focusing on how I feel is the thing that gets me to do the brave thing but doing that the night before is that thing like with Usain Bolt and your body you wake up and you're like okay I know what I'm doing and you just get on and do it and actually the first keynote I ever gave was in Florida. And it was when I was doing my coach training, I got contacted by a company saying, would you come to Florida? Yes. <laughs> and, oh, yes. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> <there's only more. laughs> and inspire our um, uh, delegates. We're having a huge conference called Ignite. And we're having this huge conference. We've got 800 delegates. Would you come and inspire them? And I said, and they said based on your life journey and I said well that's really interesting because I haven't told anyone but I'm actually training as a coach right now so how about I couple my life experience with my coach training because it's important to me to leave people with tangible tools and takeaways and not just be talking about me because that's not helpful to anybody but me so um so anyway they said I don't know if it's going to sway you but Erin Brockovich is speaking after you now I don't know if anyone else saw the film Erin Brockovich. Oh my God, it's one of my favourite films. Amazing. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Um, and actually coming back to, to the thing that you do in life, I do always think I like to say yes to things that I would actually do for free, but don't tell anybody that I work with that. <laughs> but I think, you know, I would, would I stand on a stage and, and be flown out to Florida and give this talk and be followed by Erin Brockovich for free? Hell yes. So... I went to do the talk and obviously it was huge and and it was the first time I delivered this keynote so like the pressure was really there on myself because I'm quite a perfectionist 
and I'd walked it all through the time the night before and I was kind of feeling confident and and as I walked out onto the stage the compare guy who was in um introducing me came to give me a big hug I'm like buddy get off I just want to talk go away <laughs> he gave me this big hug and my Madonna mic fell off onto the floor now mm. It was the worst thing that could have happened walking out onto a stage to give a talk. That certainly wasn't in my walking it through the night before scenario, but it was probably the best thing that could have happened because I, I leant down, picked up my microphone, fixed it back on. And by the time I'd fixed it back on, I think the audience was so on my side because they realized it was worst case scenario that it was the most amazing talk because they were so fully engaged. And, you know, that was a, that was a moment of if you think through the worst case scenario that would have been pretty up there and it was fine I just put the mm. microphone back on you know and, and we can we can rev ourselves up with fear of things that actually aren't really to be feared at all it's just human you know yeah, it's so, like, oh, so what and real as well like these things happen yeah. and actually and, yeah. and that's interesting how you said like I'm a bit of a perfectionist because um I, I too res really resonate with the like the perfectionist part when the perfectionist part comes up to play and sometimes yeah. i've done podcast interviews where i've been so nervous i've like scripted everything out i've not slept the night before because i'm like thinking about oh, what are going to be the best questions to ask this guest and mm -hmm. actually when we just let that perfectionist go yeah and just kind of just show up and just see what happens yeah then go yeah, and I just think, go with it. I think yeah. often it's it's the feeling prepared that empowers you to do the thing. You know, I think mm. we've all had that awful dream where you've got a German exam or you're out on a stage and you don't know your script. Like maybe that's just me because of my heritage, but <laughs> that, that's the one that I get. And it's like, you know, and I think the being prepared is all part of it, but you're so right. It's like actually we can really fear something. And if you just speak authentically and 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 work from the heart and you know show up as your own vulnerable self sometimes that's the best possible thing that can happen you know and that, and that was such a great experience for me with my talk because it was like okay well the worst has happened and I just happened. It, it wasn't perfect and that was fine and actually you know speaking about rob again um i read his book start now get perfect later and and i had never realized what a perfectionist I am. Like I am so ducks in a row before you launch anything. Yeah. And actually often the often the perfection thing is is just a block and it's a barrier and it's an excuse for not doing the thing. And so I launched a podcast last year just because I'd always talked about doing it and so I just did it. Um and actually, you know, to 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 start and then go, okay, I'm just gonna change that a bit and that doesn't work and yeah. fine, you know, and I yeah. uh, fear of judgment when you're somebody who's been in the public eye is huge. But I just always come back to, you know, I need to step up and be vulnerable because I want to have this impact and because I know that I can help people. Yeah, I think sometimes the perfectionist can be like just a mask that we wear to stop yeah. us from taking action. Yeah, and absolutely. I don't know who it was that made the analogy, but someone um, came up with this analogy that fear is a, a future event appearing real. Like it hasn't even happened. So yeah. until we actually do the thing that we're most scared of, then we don't really know what, what outside that fear looks like. We don't know yeah. where the opportunity exists because we haven't allowed ourselves to experience that. Yeah, and I think it's also acknowledging, I think the minute you realise everybody on the planet is scared of things, right? There's nobody that's sailing through life going, oh, this is easy. I'm just, everybody has to face fear every mm. single day. So to think that there are some people in life who are fearless and some people aren't, you're just kidding yourself and you're just giving yourself permission to play small because, oh, I'm not fearless, therefore I can't do the thing. And it's like, no, 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 you are. You can learn to fear less and you can go and do the damn thing. <laughs> Everybody feels the exact same, so stop using it as an excuse. And it really can be a massive excuse. And, you know, it's just because you're scared, so just do it. Yeah. And what I'd love to just finish on here as well, Katie, is so we know that, we push through fear, that's where the opportunity exists. You know, we take this kind of mask off and we just bloody well do it, right? Yeah. Um, and in terms of being limitless, and I love the analogy earlier you, you shared about, you know, it being boundless, like limitless, there's no boundaries. And often we do put boundaries in our own way 
and that yeah. stop us from living the life that we want to live. And I know that you're like you're uh, on your Instagram feed right now. You're gearing up to this your first group program that you're launching this weekend, which is so yeah. exciting. Um, exciting. Tell us a little bit about the program and what impact do you hope to create from working yeah. with a group of people together? So it's it's not a group program. It's a it's a standalone program, and I purposely designed it like that because I know the season we're all walking through is tricky in terms of juggling homeschooling and putting time aside for this so I wanted something that people could work through at their own pace um, and it was born out of um, me receiving DMs from people feeling overwhelmed feeling stuck feeling like they'd lost their mojo you know just feeling a bit meh right now and I was like, do you know what? This is crazy. I can do something about this to help people. And obviously with my one-to-one -one coaching, there are only so many Zoom coaching sessions I can do during a day. I wanted to be able to have an impact on a bigger scale. So I decided to come up with an online course. And I'm so excited because it's literally from the heart. And it's to help people process what we've walked through, process where we've been, really get back to who they are and what they want in life and all the things that they've parked and and you know who they are at the core when they're not being the mum the dad the friend the the colleague whatever it is because we take so much on and to strip that all back and get back to you at the core is the only thing that you can do before then deciding who you want to be going forward, working out what your values are, looking at what your limitless year ahead might look like and looking at the goals that are going to get you to your big vision and then the habits that you can put in place to get there. So I put this course together. It's 14 chapters. Um, people work through it at their own pace. And I think it's I'm so excited because I just know it's going to help so many people. And I've purposely you'll hate this bit of it. <laughs> I've got the price point crazy low because what's important to me is that people do it because I have such a heart for where we're at now and I just feel this kind of overwhelm from people of, of not knowing who they are or how they want to show up and I think this is such an opportunity where we're at right now and actually this is the amazing moment for it to be launching on Sunday where it feels like life might be slowly starting to pick up again in the not yeah. too distant future you know deciding how you want to show up to that life and who you want to be going forward is so important because otherwise you will just roll back into the life that you had before so yeah. um, if people want to sign up at katiehill.com right now they get 50 pounds off on sunday so <laughs> we'll share we'll share that link in the show. Yeah. To that bit either. <laughs> <laughs> and final question for you then katie so um, beyond you releasing your own program and, and you know focusing on your coaching work and the power of that, and I'm really excited to just follow your story this year. Um, oh. Where where do you want to be by the end of 2021? What's what's oh, the vision God. for Katie Hill? It's it just feels like it's doing that. Um, so I want to have my limitless signature course online and probably a group coaching program and maybe a membership group as well because I just know that I can help and I the reaction that I get from clients and from people on social media is so huge and you know to to use where I'm at now I guess I guess what's amazing for me is because of my heritage that's brought me to here you know and, and everywhere that everybody's been has brought them to where they are now and all of it matters but for me you know my heritage bringing me to here I guess I am a known quantity to people and so they might feel com more comfortable with me than they might with other coaches and so for me to be able to use that to really be able to empower them going forward is it's really really exciting and um yeah I just feel like I kind of almost feel breathless with it now <laughs> <laughs> because it's been quite a big thing to pull off you know with the pandemic and homeschooling and all the stuff but and all I the really, tech and all the oh my god how does it all blend together <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think there was a there was a slight hesitation in me because I do feel like social media is currently a very noisy place of people trying to sell stuff at you and I definitely didn't want to be another voice trying to sell you something I just knew that I wanted to make a difference and so that's what I keep coming back to and yeah. you know and I really hope it's gonna impact people's lives massively and then you know they, we can do the the bigger course later in the year so this is to literally reignite who you are at the core and how you're showing up to life because we don't know how things are going to pan out you know we 
the magic wand isn't going to happen and to make sure that you know deep down inside who you are, where you're going, and that you've got all the tools and techniques to help you keep moving forward, whatever life throws your way is crucial. Yeah, and I love that. And I love how, you know, every single person listening to this today has a story, yes. you know, and, yes. and it's that ability to be able to share your story, whether that's a Blue Peter story, whether it's a story about when you were a surgeon and, you, you know, it, it, that story is your story. And when people come to you to ask you for help, then to me, that's where we can start to begin our passion and our purpose to help people with what, what are people asking you about right now? How are you already helping people? And, yeah. and where do you get that fulfillment? Because like, like when you talk about this, you just light up, Katie. It's just incredible. Oh. <laughs> I think, I think the, the, you know, to go back to the uh, Captain Sir Tom Moore thing about impact, you know, I always say to to clients it's like you've got a billboard right you can put one message on it this is what I'll leave everyone with what is the message that only you can give to the world because everything that's happened in your life to now even the shit bits have brought you to where you are now and you have such a unique voice and to make sure that you're using it to have the impact on the world that you only you can have is is really important Amazing. What a great message to finish on today. Thank you so much, Katie, for joining us on the In Her Languages podcast. You've been, you've been an absolute pleasure. Certainly, you're going to be in my gratitude diary this evening. I just <laughs> been finding you on Clubhouse a few weeks ago um, and connecting with you on Instagram. So thank you so, so much. You've been an absolute pleasure. Such a pleasure. And um, if anyone wants to find me on social media, I'm at I'm Katie Hill. And my website, if you want that discount, is katiehill.com basically does what it says on the packet <laughs> <laughs> wonderful and we'll share all those links on our social media accounts and in the podcast show notes today so thank you so much katie thank you for having me and and um you know keep keep going everybody and make sure you keep showing up to live stuff because the connection is so important thank you thanks very much for listening guys have a great rest of your friday see you all soon bye